This evening, we have three speakers for the price of one. We have Dr. Maria Power, Fellow of Blackfriars Hall, University of Oxford, Senior Research Fellow in Human Dignity, La Casas Institute of Social Justice. And we also have uh, this evening, Bridge Rafferty and Diane Kirby as well. So um, I've introduced you, so let's begin. Hello, everyone. Um, as Tim said, thank you for the introduction. <laughs> and um, thank you for having us here to speak this evening. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, the association re uh, supported some research I did. So I'm delighted to be able to give something back to you. So um, what we're going to do this evening is talk to you about a research project um, that the three of us are working on together. Um, I'm by trade, I, I started out as a historian, but I'm now a, a theologian and ethicist. So I won't be talking for very long because I, I tend to do the theologizing around um, the, the amazing work that Breach and Diane do. Um, but we're gonna talk this evening about uh, a project that we're working on that aims to um, recover the histories of women of faith or religious women um, that have worked in conflict zones um, uh, across the world. We started off by um, working um, on Northern Ireland, or Diane and Breege did before they met me, were working on the project in Northern Ireland. And this is particularly significant um, because in Northern Ireland, um, the churches, in spite of the fact that everyone thinks that Northern Ireland was a religious conflict and it wasn't, um, were actually very, uh, very forceful agents for peace. Um, they engaged in back channel negotiations and there were women engaged in that. Um, they engaged in cross community collaboration, social justice work, and they engaged across um, what we as Catholics would know uh, of as the whole gamut of Catholic social teaching in terms of trying to find a non-violent solution to the conflict in Northern Ireland. So, um, Diane and I met almost by accident um, and she was telling me about this project and it sounded amazing and I was really delighted when Diane and Breege invited me to join them and the project now has a home at the Las Casas Institute at um, Blackfriars Hall in Oxford and we've got a dedicated web page if any of you want to look it up or get in contact with us about the project if any of you have your own stories to tell or um, might know some uh, a woman of faith or a religious woman who has worked in a conflict zone. But what we really want to show um, and what, what we're really arguing is that research has shown that um, women make a significant contribution in conflict zones, especially um, in terms of uh, staying with the people and helping to promote justice and peace. Um, in terms of Northern Ireland, women religious were among those who played crucial roles in confronting and subverting the conflict. And Breege is going to talk about that in a moment. And in building peace. These sisters were part of public and collective expressions of suffering. Um, and despite risks to their own personal safety, and again, Breege and Diane will talk about this, it was often their leadership which drew others together with a shared vision for peace and reconciliation. So uh, Breach and Diane have been working on recovering these histories because um, despite the fact that uh, women religious were so prominent um, in building peace in Northern Ireland, they've been ignored both by feminist and religious scholars. And we want to kind of try and correct that imbalance. And Breach and Diane have been working on this since 2014. Um, and we're now extending the project to um, recover the voices of sisters who have, um, as I said, worked in challenging ministries in conflict zones. So um, we're interviewing women that have worked in Angola, Rwanda, Uganda, and their stories are just as amazing, but also very similar to um, the women that have um, worked in Northern Ireland. The common theme that we always hear is we stayed with the people so I'm going to hand over now to Breege 
who has recently um, completed a, a wonderful PhD at um, Queen's University Belfast called Caught in the Crossfire, um, Women, Religious and the Troubles, um, 1968 to 1998. Is that right, Brie? 2008. 2008. Yeah. Um, and she's going to talk, um, her paper is entitled, Sure, What Did the Nuns Do? Catholic Sisters and Peace Building in Northern Ireland. And if you just bear with me, I'm just going to, I'm in charge of technology this evening. So. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so good evening and thank you to the English Catholic Historical Association for the opportunity to present our research. As Maria has outlined, uh, this oral history project examines the global peace building experiences of women religious. And the focus of my contribution, as Maria has said, is the peace building efforts of sisters in Northern Ireland during an historical time frame commonly, commonly known as the Troubles. Um, as we know, religion in Northern Ireland is divisive. It separated people during the Troubles into different schools, streets and workplaces. And people died because they were either identified as a Catholic or a Protestant. And during these years, the churches in Northern Ireland provided a sense of identity and communal belonging for many people who found solace in personal religious faith. Although historians argue if in fact there was a religious dimension to the war, as Maria has said, if it was a holy war, uh, the church's involvement in reconciliation and peace process has been complex from the beginning. Although many individuals within the churches were committed to working for peace, in some academic discourse, the churches were accused of failing to, quote, be homogenous or united in their commitment, but rather there seemed to be an emphasis on the preservation of individual identity, segregated worship, and the self-preservation of doctrines, which often emphasize social and religious division. So this paper tonight argues that respect for the identity and culture of all communities was fundamental to the mission of individual sisters who strove to bring an end to societal division. And the efforts of these women place them central to traditional religious peacemaking initiatives. Oral historian Anna Bryson rightly posits that there are few more things powerful than the authentic voice of experience. And it always doesn't, it doesn't always come through, but when it does, it never ceases to move and to humble and to help us more deeply and more generously to understand the past. Yet, as Maria has said, the treatment previously accorded the religious dimension of the conflict has provoked debate, with traditional historical narratives tending to focus on the contribution of male clergy. Whilst the, women, whilst the voices of women religious were rarely heard. And the omission of these voices from the fast historiography of the conflict could lead to the active roles of sisters within such a troubled society going virtually unnoticed. So that's where I got the title for this paper, because on more than one occasion, I have been asked, so what did the nuns do? Well, this oral history project shows what they did, what they continue to do, and the ministries of these women who merged religious commitment with action places them central to the practical application of Vatican II on the ground in Northern Ireland. As we know, peacemaking is, comes in many forms. It's a personal commitment. It is often done through alliances and networks. It also has challenges and can involve risk, loss and trauma. So we do not propose that this research offers a definitive representation of all religious sisters or all religious communities in Northern Ireland. Um, because for example, despite requests, some contemplative institutes did not wish to participate. And that's not to say that they weren't part of the movement for peace. I use the example of the poor clares in, in Belfast, a contemplative order. And what they did in, in adherence to the theology of presence, they built a listening parlor onto their convent. And this was one, this was to enable people to have a safe space. 
and people cued to express their worries and their pains to these sisters. And as one said, sometimes it's more than marching with banners. Sometimes actions such as providing listening spaces and prayer all play a part in working for peace. So um, I think the next, uh, I'd like to thank these participants from these religious um, institutes. Many of the sisters were from these institutes and um, without them, there would be no project. Um, but there was many challenges to the project. By the very nature of religious life, sisters do not wish to draw attention to their ministries. They certainly do not look for praise. And as a result, it can be argued that the sisters to some degree have been complicit in their own omission from the historical record by refusing interviews or um, allowing access to, to archives. But undoubtedly, a fear of speaking out persists, which may be attributed to the sensitive nature of this research, the era in which it was undertaken, when fear of speaking out about the troubles or the ongoing historical abuse scandals involving the Catholic Church in Ireland were commonplace. Consequently, ethical concerns such as trust building were vital to this project. And I think uh, this developed and evolved over a period of time. And I think my biographical background was crucial to the process initially. Um, I grew up in Uri, John Lee Nationalist Town in County Down, where I experienced the conflict at first hand and thus I have an insider's perspective of the struggles of the era. So whilst I argue that complete objectivity is impossible, because of my own cultural experience, research transparency and periods of prolonged negotiations undoubtedly reassured some of the sisters and influenced their willingness to participate. Um, Alwyn Houghton argues that um, a nun's history should always be seen within the context of the society of which she is a part. And in 1968, this was the period when Northern Ireland society succumbed to a violent conflict which lasted for over 30 years. Here's a few statistics. As we can see, more than 3,600 people lost their lives and included where 186 children were killed between Patrick Rooney in 1969 and Michael McElveen in 2006. And among the casualties were one religious sister, Catherine Dunn from the Order of St. Louis, who died when an IRA roadside bomb exploded in Middletown, County Armagh, in July 1990, and three policemen also lost their lives in this explosion. Now, the escalation of societal conflict during the late 1960s coincided with the ongoing transformation within the Catholic Church, as theological directives which emanated from the Second Vatican Council encouraged religious sisters into doing um, God's work through active engagement with contemporary society. Um, the decree Perfecti Caritatis, for example, mandated a renewal program, enabled sisters to explore their identity and um, reevaluate many aspects of religious devotion, how they live their lives. And adhering to the conciliar imperative to read the signs of the times, members of religious communities returned to their original roots, revisited the spirit or the charism um, of their institutes and the way it sh shaped spirit, purpose, and ministry. And religious communities in Northern Ireland moved cautiously towards modernization, incorporating changes in the structures of their institutes, how they prayed, the modification of the habit, and where they lived. And subsequently, as sisters relocated from their convents into local communities, they witnessed violence and sectarianism at first hand and to a new degree, and they negotiated a space for activism amidst the chaos. As they connected to the social conditions of the era, they began to work not only for the people, but with and among the people. And during the interviews, they emphasized their connection to the option for the poor and social injustice, not only locally, but globally, identifying the struggles of the Catholic community in Northern Ireland with the struggles for equality, peace, unity, and justice in other, country, in other countries suffering conflict. And this work highlights the liberationist thinking had a global reach. And as sisters attempted to break down societal division through active peacemaking endeavors, one sister explained that they journeyed alongside those suffering, quote, in witness of peace, offering simple but necessary countersigns of cross community interdependence and a viral of the sacredness of all life. But they realized that peace building was slow and complex. Struggles were felt in the grassroots by sisters 
working in some of the most deprived and oppressed areas, assisting families, educating children, and often subject, subjected to intrusion from British soldiers, the RUC, as well as intimidation from Republican and loyalist, loyalist paramilitary groupings. And it was against this backdrop of continuing mayhem that one of the most widely known members of the Catholic Church, Mother Teresa, now St. Teresa, arrived into Bally Murphy in 1971. And I use this sister's arrival as early evidence of the simple but effective participation of sisters in creating outlets for women and children who are suffering as a consequence of conflict. Mother Teresa and her sisters were often photographed going about their daily routines and their gender made them more accessible than the male clergy. They were accepted by women in the area who needed practical support. Obviously, media savvy, the arrival of the Missionaries of Charity made international news and propelled the activism of sisters in Belfast onto the worldwide stage. Their presence benefited the local community, not only practically, but as local curate Father Des Wilson noted, they helped negate the unfair propaganda about the area and confound the hostile press and those who wanted to depict Bally Murphy as a derelict ghetto. But as the violence escalated, many sisters recognised how little they knew about the main, how little the main churches knew about each other's perspectives or traditions. And theologian Sister Geraldine Smith noted that one of the challenges was to cross the boundaries of fear and resentment, and for the churches to look beyond their chaplain, to look beyond being chaplains to their own tribe but to become chaplains to the priest process, chaplains to communities of reconciliation. Now, while it's not as publicly militant or visible as their global counterparts, individual sisters began to approach peace building from a holistic perspective, which highlighted the importance of the communities in which they lived and worked. They took a variety of approaches, either individually or collectively, working with like-minded others in numerous cross-community initiatives, and organizations such as Embrace or Community Dialogue. And some became the face of organizations, others became the voice of organizations, and they participated in public forums. And loan ministries were soon replaced by partnership across congregational boundaries, as well as mem members of the male clergy, members of other faiths and lay communities. And the collaborative nature of this participation, which was in stark contrast to sisters' lives prior to Vatican II, enabled them to identify with those who were once perceived, as we say in Northern Ireland, as the other side, and some gained a feminist consciousness and identified a nexus between sacrament and solidarity. Ecumenical uh, communities such as Coramila, the Cora community, which was founded here by Noreen, Sister Noreen Christian, or the Irish School of Ecumenics, where Dominican Geraldine Smith, was a member of staff for more than 20 years and was twice its director, enabled theological and ecumenical discussion on the role of churches and routes to peace. Participating in such talks, sisters began to build on their informal approach and efforts were often carried out despite without money or much ceremony. It was dependent on diplomacy and respect for both communities. And as Maria's work has highlighted, this did much to quote, violence was not religiously justifiable. But from the outset and above all, I was mindful that sisters must be viewed within the context of a troubled time and place, and there were risks to peace building in the grassroots. But like sisters based in conflict zones throughout the world, these women made conscious decisions to be there, aware of the personal risks involved. And um, we've come across the example of Marie McNeese. She's a found cross and passion sister. She's a founder of WAVE. Um, which is a trauma, which is now with Trauma Centre. And it was a cross-community, non-denominational victim support group originally formed to support and empower women whose husbands or partners were murdered during the Troubles. Um, but as Marie told us, um, she discovered in the early days of WAVE that she was on somebody's death list. To quote her, I discovered, I don't know why the police came to the door. They said, change your route do this, do that. I thought they'd got it wrong. Hating their warning, she took precautions, but undeterred, continued her quiet work. We were being criticised by the IRA. We were being criticised by the loyalists. And I remember at one point being really afraid and afraid also for my family. It's one thing me sticking my, head, my neck out, but, the, but they didn't. McNeese stressed that her work was not a holy gesture. And whilst as a young sister, she was out to save the world in the name of God. 
it has taken her until now to realize you really don't have to do that. Instead, although sisters were often unsure how their presence would be received, physical gestures such as McNeese's efforts or paying respect at the homes or funerals of Protestant families or of victims of the Troubles were important acts of public unity. And although women's efforts were often conducted against a backdrop of competing patriarchal narratives, which often presented their uh, simplistic and overgeneralized gender construct of women as do-gooders, while men were the true peace activists, sisters' peace building was purposeful and constructive, and the contributions to, to and their and their contribution to things like the Opsile Commission evidenced what Stephen Bevan described as doing theology in the public sphere. Um, and I just want to bring this to your attention, the teaching communities in other parts of the United Kingdom of the Republic of Ireland, unlike those community sisters who were in classrooms throughout the north of Ireland, found themselves caught up in extraordinary conditions. And as the violence intensified and pupils arrived to school heavily burdened, it was the classroom provided respite from the mayhem beyond the school walls. And from many fear and the issue of sectarianism pervaded all aspects of life. Identification of the other side was made easy by a person's name, but also by the school they attended, and in particular, the school uniform they wore. And these factors contributed to emphasizing stereotypical ideals. And thus, for some, the educational system was to the fore in reflecting and reinforcing sectarian division. And before the introduction of integrated education in Northern Ireland during the 1980s, we had either Protestant controlled schools or Catholic uh, maintained schools. And as Bishop Edward Daly, Edward Daly once noted, despite all the efforts to preserve the Catholic ethos in schools, it failed to, to um, prevent many of the alumni from joining the ranks of the IRA. Yet individual sisters focused on education as an alternative to conflict and was a means whereby students could alter or escape the difficult circumstances in which they lived. They were aware that class division was as prevalent as religious division. And the, the, the homes that were more likely to be raided by the army or, or, or and the parents interned were really children from working class areas rather than not children who were educated primarily in grammar schools. So sisters such as Genevieve O'Farrell here, she began to instigate change within her own school. And for example, she, she has been quoted as saying she saw education as liberating the poor from a mood of passive despair. She opposed the selection process in Northern Ireland, claiming it separated 11 year olds into first class sheep and second class goats. There was, the school uniform was affordable, there were no school fees. And any local clergy who questioned her approach were reminded that this isn't a second class school for second class people. Indeed, O'Farrell's biographer said she came to personify the face, um, the new face of an Irish religious sister during these years. And she was everything the conservative priests feared nuns and sisters might become, assertive, independent and feminist. So despite the violence, it was business as usual within school perimeters and the sisters were consistent in their efforts to avoid perpetuation of generational sectarianism. They encouraged the development of mutual understanding between children of different religious persuasions and they strove to avoid the militarization of children in their care. Measures taken included developing the curriculum to include the history of unionism, organizing school trips for Catholic and Protestant children together, arranging inter-school activities, including musicals or choirs and school clubs, and school assemblies were opportunities to tell pupils, don't join any organization, stay away from crowds, love your enemies, have forgiveness, because Protestant tears are the same as Catholic tears. And whilst an element of risk um, existed for sisters teaching in Catholic areas, those Catholic sisters teaching in Protestant areas lack the security that a nationalist area could offer. And this report, this, these statistics here are taken from a report given to me by a sister who was a former principal of Our Lady of Mercy School in Ballysillan. And the, um, the report lists 1976 as the worst year for the school. And as you can see, between September and December that year, three pupils um, were murdered. Um, in the report, she's written three pupils deliberately shot dead at point blank range, two while dressed in school uniform. Anne McGee, age 15, Carol McMenemy, age 15, and Geraldine McCone, age 14. 
The report describes the 1980s as a decade marked by petrol bombs and arson attacks, bullets delivered to the school, and the personal risk to individual sisters was evident when the RUC informed the principal that she was on a loyalist assassination list. When she concluded her report, the principals said to me, despite the long, difficult years there have been among all those associated with Our Lady of Mercy, a strong conviction that the school must remain open to show by word and example that love is the only answer. Hatred and revenge have no place in our solution. But the continuous cycle of violence meant that communities of children were traumatized. And the reality is many were seen as easy targets. In the absence of fathers or siblings or mothers through death or incarceration, the early indoctrination of children in the home, uh, children were coerced into acts of violence and often turned their allegiance to gangs who could provide a sense of shared identity and they could make an active contribution to the cause. Helen Brocklehurst argues that the militarization of children was deemed a cumulative process, originating in the acceptance of violence as a means to an end. It often concluded with the mobilization of children as members of paramilitary groupings. So while, Paris, so while the paramilitary organizations deny the use of children, this slide shows a memorial a quote, erected by the Republican people of Ballymurphy in proud and loving memory of all those volunteers from the area who lost their lives in the fight for Irish freedom. If you look closely, you see that one of the volunteers was a 12 year old girl who died in 1973. So by the 1980s, um, this was there was remarkable cross community effort as many women from both Protestant and Catholic communities forged pathways to reconciliation. The destruction of communities following the 1993 Shank Hill bombing, 1998 Oma bombing, reaffirmed sisters' conviction in the importance of unity, the theology of forgiveness. Some women religious united in response to acts of extreme violence. In July 1994, a group of 16 religious and peace activists, including sisters Noreen Christian, Rosalind Murray, Margaret Rose McSparn, and Concilia Dennehy, all members of Religious for Justice and Peace, signed a statement condemning the abduction, torture, and murder of a young mother from West Belfast. And this public activism shows that the lives of sisters were often interlinked. They became allies through a mutual desire for justice and peace, and were not confined to one peace building activity, but were openly supporting a range of significant campaigns. While it might be easier to make a statement when the winds of peace were blowing, their public stance and the roles they were willing and able to take as, as members of a movement of a change Evidence, evidence is a shift in their religious identity, identities, both individually and collectively, since the 1960s. But unfortunately, with little support, the personal impact of the troubles on some sisters was immense. One recalled the terrible strains and stresses accompanying the bereaved being caught up in bombs um, when their areas were taken over by the army and the sheer terror of it. Um, and indeed, this sister, this interview here, um, this sister revealed that support was not forthcoming from her own religious community. She, reviewed, she revealed how one sister instructed her, don't talk about anything, don't talk about the troubles. I don't want the other sisters disturbed. And because of this enforced silence, sisters living together in community had no insight into the invisible burdens that each carried. She likened this situation to a schizoid situation, explaining that it was all internalized, there wasn't anybody you could talk to or about. And it was the shock of the brutality of what was going on in her community and the shame of it. Now she sought psychological help, which aided her recovery. But in revisiting traumatic events, these women were reconnecting not with an historical crisis, but with a part of their being and what Kramer describes as an ongoing reality. Um, so I would say that it's important these voices are heard because these, without these testimonies, there is an incomplete picture of the troubles. These sisters were part of public and collective, collective expressions of suffering. And despite risks to their own personal safety, it was often their leadership which drew each others together in a, in a shared vision for peace. AMRI, the Association of Leaders of Missionaries and Religious of Ireland, in their annual report recorded less than 7,000 sisters in Ireland. And communities such as the Bon Secours, who have been who have been in the north of Ireland from the 19th century, have now have now uh, withdrawn, uh, thus preserving the historical record of these communities takes on a new urgency. But above all, the legacy of peace in Northern Ireland can, in part, be attributed to the efforts of religious sisters 
who with insight and personal experience were equipped to engage in an alternative paradigm, offering education as a way out of misery, or working alongside individuals involved in social movements and faith communities who sought to live in peace. In expanding their ministries and peace building, these sisters have responded to the call of Vatican II for Christian unity and through their in in engagement with the modern theology of the church based on the human experience. Therefore, they did, to quote Margaret McGuinness, they simply, they simply had done what the church had asked of them. And I'd like to conclude with a statement from a former pupil, the Sisters of Mercy, who summarized her feelings about the ministries of sisters in Belfast during the years of the Troubles. Their ministry didn't stop at half three when they finished school as teachers. Their ministry continued where it, continued where it was needed, in the darkest hours, in the darkest places, in the darkest situations. That's where those women were, and that's where those women continue to be, and they don't say a word about it. So thank you for listening, and I hand you over to Diane. Okay, I thought, well, thank you very much indeed, Bridge, and, and, and hello uh, to everybody. The first time myself and Bridge gave a presentation on women religious almost seven years ago now, it was at a three-day conference at the Loyola Institute uh, in Dublin. Uh, it was on the, the, the conference, was on the church in the modern world. Ours was the only paper on women religious. Presentations were in blocks of three, and when we went to the allocated room, it was full to the rafters and included a cardinal in the audience. When it was our turn to present, apart from a handful of sisters, the room vacated. One sister was so distressed, she sobbed throughout the presentation, sorrowfully asking at the end where everybody had gone. So you're all being here tonight really, really is a delight, really is a delight for us. Now, what, what I'm going to do uh, uh, um, in my follow on from Breach, Breach went on to do a PhD uh, uh, um, in parallel with the Witness Seminars that focused very much on uh, Catholic sisters. But the Witness Seminars um, moved on to include Protestant women because, as, as Breach indicated, uh, um, they, uh, they didn't just work alone. They worked with other people in the community um, who, who supported them. And they very much wanted to emphasise um, the level of support uh, that they, they were getting and the, the level of, of cooperation and collaboration. Um, so I'm just looking at um, Maria because slide one should be, should be on my, my screen as my PowerPoint being, is my PowerPoint. All right, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, right, so that's uh, slide one, which is obviously the, the uh, American Civil Rights Movement. And if you look carefully, you'll see there's a black sister there and uh, altogether, there are four sisters that you can see in this bit. Uh, so they, they, they do outnumber the priests. So this is just to, is, is to show that, um, uh, you know, women relig religious are, are involved in struggles for social justice uh, well beyond uh, Northern, uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, so now we can move on to slide two, uh, which, which, which reflects what we're, what we're hoping to do, uh, uh, which is look at women religious uh, in, in, in global conflict situations. And I just love this photograph because you can see uh, they're just going about their daily business, getting on with everything as if they're not clearly in a very dangerous war zone, which Nicaragua in 1978, which is when this picture uh, was taken, uh, really was. Now, in a war saturated world, it has never been more important to understand the dynamics of conflict resolution and peace building. Yet key contributors to these complex, intricate and time consuming processes have consistently been overlooked religious women. Catholic sisters in particular have quietly, perhaps too quietly, undertaken critical roles in conflict zones around the world for centuries. Uh, these, these slides, as I said, uh, share their presence in, 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 in different venues, but this is, these, these are taken from the 20th century, um, but you can go back. Uh, I was reading um, a very interesting book about the, the role of the, uh, the uh, sisters in, in, the, in the Crimean War alongside uh, Florence Nightingale. So in essence, women religious are to be found wherever there is injustice, poverty, pain, disease, deprivation, conflict and carnage. Yet their work and, and its significance have been notably neglected, if not entirely disregarded, by mainstream historians and conflict specialists alike. 
This, despite the attention accorded and the emphasis on the United Nations Women, Peace and Security agenda. Moving testimony to the importance of the presence of Catholic sisters in war zones was given in the very first witness seminar that gave rise to this project. The speaker is Fall, Falls Road born Dominican sister Liz Smith. Brought up during the Troubles, she did not serve as a sister in Belfast. She attended the seminar to make sure that the sisters and others who supported her community were remembered. Now, please note Smith stressing that the sisters were not alone. This was a message constantly reiterated by the sisters, becoming an important determinant in the project's subsequent direction. Whoops, there's no sound, is there? Can everybody hear? I can't hear my end. Yes, exactly. Those of us who were born and weren't given the choice, they were we were born, weren't given the choice of our parents. That, and, and I suppose I haven't actually worked in Belfast as a religious sister. Um, I grew up in it um, and since then I was born in 1964, so my, my reality was pre religious life. And therefore, when I reflect back on what religious sisters did and what the church it did. I, I now realize, and I guess in hindsight, that there was the religious sisters and then there was the church. Yes. And there was the church that hadn't a clue what was going on. And unfortunately, that was my experience. I'm not saying that's true, but that was how I perceived it as a young person. There were nice people, nice priests, nice, every uh, now and again came in. The sisters were people and their lay colleagues who I think made up that because they weren't on their own it wasn't just the sisters it was the the, 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 the the teachers and the youth workers and the people around they were the people who didn't give up on you they were the people who believed in you they were the people who called you forth they were the people that told you just because you happened to be born into a family as well in the middle of the falls road didn't mean that that's where your life had to end they were the people who said there is somewhere outside here there are different experiences and they didn't give up when the when the stones got thrown. They didn't get up when the bomb went off at the local pub. They didn't walk away. And I saw might have. We wouldn't have known. We would have just thought they were assigned out. But I suppose that now I say 30 years later and 30 years in Dominican that what it has done for me is it has made me realize I can't give up on the young people that I work with. And that is because my experience was that people who influenced me as a young person didn't get up. They didn't come in and look at us like other people did um, you know somebody recently said to me i'm going to belfast for the weekend and we're doing the black taxi tour at staff member in the school i work now and i went oh yeah and she said you don't approve and i said no i felt like a monkey in the zoo and that is how we felt as, as young people growing up that these buses come in these buses go out these people come in these news reporters come in they take photographs and if you could picture photograph on top of the saracen with the rubber bullet and you got on tv it wasn't wonderful mm -hmm. But that wasn't wonderful because they all drove away. The sisters didn't. And I'm sure the priests didn't either, but for us it was a day. And, and, and the teachers didn't. And that's where it, and it was that, that, that thing. That's, that's where the risk taking. It isn't exciting to see somebody being shot. What is good though is that there were people there who listened to it. Um, and when bombs did go off and you had to move out of your house. And you went to St. Mary's College and the sisters. And I remember years later meeting one of those sisters who I remember clearly that as a child, uh, Sister Simeon, she had since died because she looked so like my grandma. And I remember going over that night to, to St. Mary's College and her welcoming us in as, as family when, when the pigeon club had I'm given my So it's that type of thing. They were there. But they never once said, like Geraldine said, you know, it was like they never told us they were doing anything, they just did it. Yeah. And that's yeah. um, so people yeah. did take yeah. risks. Uh, but it and and, and 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 people of my age know yeah. that they don't. 
Right, uh, um, if anybody wants to, um, uh, I'll be giving the uh, link at the end uh, because um, apart from Sister Liz Smith, uh, there's also uh, two other sisters uh, that speak um, on that on that link. Uh, and the link I'll be giving you will take you to some of the early witness seminars uh, that we did. Okay, now I want to address now the way in which uh, the project expanded, some of the obstacles it confronted, and what it has so far managed to do. Now, what started as an oral history project collecting the experiences of Catholic sisters during the Troubles evolved far beyond anything we initially imagined. It revealed that religious women played a crucial role in confronting, subverting, and eventually ending the mayhem and murder of what was a long, dirty, and vicious war. It shines a light on a dimension of the conflict, networks of grassroots activism, that is badly neglected in Troubles historiography. Moreover, the conversations and stories collected for this project have universal application in terms of excavating the hidden stories of armed insurgencies, particularly in the realm of giving voice to and helping empower the marginalized and neglected. The first departure of the project from its original exclusive focus on Catholic sisters derived from the emphasis placed by the sisters themselves on being part of a collective endeavor that embraced their female counterparts in other Christian denominations who shared the same values, concerns and goals. Unfortunately for us, uh, they also shared the same reluctance to talk and the same sense of not having done anything of specific importance. All historians are well acquainted with the disinclination of women generally to talk about themselves or sufficiently value their activities. It is a trait amplified many times over in Northern Ireland's religious women. Their level of self-assessment proved so effective that feminist scholars committed to highlighting the roles of women in the conflict managed to miss them entirely. Feminist scholars did wonderful work in calling out Northern Ireland's entrenched misogyny and the way women's multifaceted roles and consequential contributions had been written out of Troubles history. Feminist scholars bitterly and rightly complained that women had been rendered invisible. Hence, in effect, prior to this project, religious women were the invisible of the invisible. Most still are. More declined to participate than agreed, and in all fairness, usually citing compelling reasons. Foremost, fear of repercussions for people still living and working in communities where paramilitarism remains a presence. The same reasoning caused some contributors to withdraw some or all of their testimony. The long shadow of the Troubles remains a significant impediment. Northern Irish silences have been famously captured by poet Seamus Heaney, who enshrined the combatant community command, whatever you say, say nothing. He also referred to guarded tongues, or rather governed tongues. The cessation of violence following the 1998 Good Friday Agreement shifted the conflict to the cultural arena. Combat commenced over historical memory. Tongues became more guarded still as the battle of narratives rendered unwelcome recollections that deviated from the prevailing male-dominated and all too often self-serving self partisan portrayals of the past. Checking and confirming research via other sources is good practice. However, in a, in a context where new and alternative and most certainly counter narratives are discouraged, it has been a challenge. It oftentimes requires ambushing key figures at public events, and it certainly demands a great deal of patience and persistence and remains an ongoing process, but one which is necessary uh, to show uh, the evidence that we are collecting can be verified from, from um, um, uh, other sources and the sisters themselves. Reach mentioned the deterrent effect of church scandals on potential participants. They also caused some colleagues included to question the project itself, implying that a focus on anything other than 
Magdalen laundries, mother and baby homes, etc., could only be some sort of whitewashing endeavour. I was even accused of going netting. Equally disturbing, some feminist scholars imbued with negative perceptions of religious women as ciphers of ultra-conservative, regressive institutions that oppress women were resistant to our research findings. It seemed that any research indicating that church women and men are capable of good work and value to the wider society was unwelcome in some quarters. Uh, Oh, thank you, Pokemon Slide 5. What we have so far uncovered shows that through both presence and activism during the Troubles, religious women became a factor in creating the climate on the ground and the depth of communications between the warring parties that facilitated reconciliation. They became, they became party to the difficult and dangerous labour within working class communities that noted international peace builders credit with preventing the troubles from degenerating into civil war. Significant contributors to the work of civil society on the pathway to peace, religious women saw that class distinction was as prevalent as religious division and directed their efforts towards securing a positive peace. With democratic aspirations for social justice and equality, as well as peace, some headed up and even founded a variety of organisations, uh, to which, of course, Bridge referred in her paper. They also contributed their ideas and expertise to public debates. For example, participation in the most detailed consultation process ever held in Northern Ireland, the 1992-93 Upsal Commission, which provided a platform for open dialogue and engagement across the political and religious divide. They subsequent, subsequently were party to women winning, winning electoral power by the Women's Coalition, which influenced the Good Friday Agreement and the key legislation that followed. The shared values of religious women working for a just resolution to the conflict are clearly discernible in the political programme the Women's Coalition put forward and in the legislation it fought to secure. Initially operating on the margins of society, religious women turned their invisibility into an asset. Deemed powerless, they turned weakness into strength. In a conflict where religion was part of the problem, they drew together to make it part of the solution. At the most basic level, their spiritual presence amidst the suffering, solidarity with all victims, resistance to competent control and coercion, quietly challenged and subverted paramilitary legitimation strategies informed by religio-political myths and sacrificial discourses. The presence of religious women was a daily reminder that life was sacred, children were precious, education and everyday living mattered. Ironically, their ability to take risks and cross community boundaries was facilitated by the invisibility and marginalization imposed on them by male community power brokers, reflecting wider societal attitudes dismissive of women generally. The nature of war and peace building requires high levels of confidentiality. That means some elements are never fully known. If ever known at all. As the research accumulated, we realized the unfolding stories were oftentimes as unknown to the participants as to us. One telling example is that of the Presbyterian minister, Leslie Carroll. At the first witness seminar she attended, she revealed that she had become involved in the highly sensitive and secret peace building initiatives emanating from Clonard Monastery. These involved high-ranking paramilitaries, their political wings and politicians. The Clonard talks are now acknowledged as critical to the process that led to the Good Friday Agreement. Carroll worked closely alongside their key architect, redemptorist priest Alec Reed. A great deal has now been written about Reed 
his fellow redemptorist, Jerry Reynolds, and indeed, most of the men involved. Invariably, I might add, with no mention of any female participation, let alone that of religious women. Yet the project established that religious women were the first, and for a long time, the only female participants in these back channel talks. In Carol's initial recounting, she emphasized that the opportunity for women to contribute to the peace talks was by the invitation from the men. Without the men, she wouldn't have been there, or so she thought. From a subsequent witness seminar, she was to learn that far from the men having recognized the value or even the necessity of including women, it was religious women who were aware of the talks who determined that women had to have a place at their table. The vo their voices had to be heard. Religious women belonging to the Cornerstone community, an ecumenical reconciliation group separate from the churches, admitted to putting pressure on Father Jerry Reynolds. I quote, we had him tortured. It was Reynolds who approached Carol. For a Presbyterian minister and a woman to boot, to be approached by a Catholic priest to meet the IRA and in a monastery was a shock. I quote Carol. Jerry Adams was the devil incarnate. The priests were only the next thing to the devil incarnate. So it was a horrifying thought, yet a moment of wonderful opportunity. The sentiment expressed in that last phrase, a moment of wonderful opportunity, highlights the premium that religious women placed on obedience to God. It was a priority that moved them to transcend denominational and doctrinal differences and sectarian divides. It required reaching out to each other and to the other side with love and forgiveness, however difficult, which they made clear it most certainly was. Such traits distinguished and marked the mission of religious women from that of their secular counterparts. I quote Carol, emphasizing, as did others, the importance of love. This business of loving enemies mattered to me. That wasn't something that I understood Jesus to just say as a kind of a throwaway. You might think about loving your enemies. That was a command I had to obey. That's where your evangelical Protestant traditions really work for you. The prevailing scholarly consensus is that during the conflict, the church has failed to provide prophetic leadership. On the ground, however, religious women were part of a strong prophetic presence that led them to become party to personal, societal and political reconciliation, critical agents for change and effective peace builders. The extent of their activities was neatly summed up by a Quaker and Bennett, a project participant, as ranging from dining with diplomats to praying with gunmen. The Quakers, of course, had strong presence in the prisons. The presence of other religious women in the prisons and their interaction with gunmen is important. Incarcerated combatants were crucial players in the process and the progress of the peace talks. From their work in the prisons to their presence in the Clonard talks, religious women made an impact on the peace process and its ultimate success. They helped break the deadlock when talks descended into familiar patterns of each side blaming the other with the process going nowhere. Religious women are known to be, I quote, great listeners. They understood the necessity and value of listening. They facilitated and supported a process of storytelling to help each side fully and properly understand the other at all levels. It was critical to shifting the meetings from a blame game to a process of sharing pain recognizing a common humanity, building trust on the basis of knowledge and understanding. Most importantly, they brought to the negotiations a wholly different set of calculations to those of the belligerent parties. All the belligerents 
were preoccupied by cost benefit analyses, complicated by intangibles such as honor, pride, and ideology. Belligerents fear appearing weak, hence the tendency to continue killing even as the talks are underway. Their readiness to sustain violence is intended to maintain shows of strength, to convey high resolve and to avoid reputational risk. For the religious women deeply disturbed by the human costs of conflict, there were no cost benefit analyses. Rather, as project participants who became party to dialogue with paramilitaries freely conceded, they brought with them, I quote, raw emotion and a sense of urgency. I quote, we women mostly know that there isn't time for all this talking. There are lives at risk and there are things to be done. Let's get on with it. So we tended to cut to the quick, I think. The religious women became the vital ingredient that, as one of them put it, cut through an awful lot of the posturing. The results were palpable. From religious women's entry into proceedings in the early 1990s, a more overt commitment to the peace process began to be seen. The emphasis in the discourse appreciably moved from victimhood to agency with previous pretensions to idealism strategically replaced by a perceptibly practical realism. Each side could be seen to become positively proactive instead of negatively reactive. The process was to be managed rather than resisted. A key example was the Republican transition from physical force to constitutionalism. That sisters and other religious women were active during the troubles should be no surprise, given their rich and complex histories replete with struggles um, against violence, injustice, poverty and oppression. However, it still remains the case that a focus on women, especially when the research and writing are done by women, is regarded as niche, something of interest to women, but not necessarily the wider community. Fortunately, thanks to the Her Story Peace Heroines exhibition, our research is now reaching a popular audience. Her Story is an organization that tells Irish women's stories through the arts via exhibitions, shows, and education projects. The exhibition was launched last year at Stormont and was recently shown at the Irish Embassy in London. It is presently touring Ireland and shown in schools as well as a range of public venues. Hence, it is reaching audiences usually beyond the purview of academics. There is also progress on the academic front. Our research will be appearing in forthcoming chapters in mainstream history and politics volumes. The Routledge Handbook of the Troubles and an Oxford University Press book on women in British politics. Nonetheless, the fact remains that we have but exposed the tip of the iceberg and there remains a tremendous amount of work to be undertaken in this field. Fortunately for us, the Global Sisters Report recently announced the planned publication of stories from sisters serving in conflict zones, invaluable material for us that will help the project move forward into as yet unexplored areas and answer the range of questions raised by the research to date. It is a boon to the project's aspiration to generate a full appreciation of religious women's capacity to bring communities together, to create safe spaces in which the powerless find voice and agency, while at the same time making connections between belligerents and forging relationships between opposing sides and across sectarian divides. To conclude, religious women mattered and matter still in conflict zones around the world. Understanding what they have been able to achieve, how and why, is essential for successful conflict resolution. It is incumbent on us that we make sure their stories are not forgotten. We must heed Irish President Michael D. Higgins' reminder that in dealing with the past, especially if we hope to learn from it, a strategy of amnesia is simply not an option. Thank you.
Hey, thank you very much. Uh, Maria, do you want to add anything at all? No, um, just, just to say again, if um, anyone's interested in hearing more about the project, um, just Google Women Religious Blackfriars Oxford and um, you'll learn more about us. And um, we are going to be putting more of the witness seminars up online um, in, in the coming months. So. Excellent. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question and put it into the chat box, then perhaps we could uh, ask the speakers some questions. Uh, if anybody's interested, the chat box is available on the, uh, the the bar thing that's on on there somewhere or other. Anyway, you can just open it up. I've put a message on there to welcome everybody. Anyway, um, it's fascinating, fascinating uh, talks. I think a lot of us here were probably taught by nuns. I certainly was for six and a half years. Uh, in my life, uh, cross and passion. They were certainly cross anyway, and probably <laughs> passion too, but really cross, I think. But um, they were, and some of them were Irish nuns, and they were they were wonderful people actually, and taught us uh, taught us very well, in fact, actually, uh, I think. Um, and I first came across uh, women in the sort of peace process when I went to a talk once with Mairead Corrigan many years ago, and uh, was really interesting. I think it was called uh, Hope Not Bombs. I think that was the name of it anyway. Um, and um, I chatted with Mairead afterwards and uh, she was a very powerful speaker from a very ordinary background. Her father was a window cleaner uh, and she was from a poor area of the falls. And that was a fascinating thing. So, and after that, sometime after that, I became involved in the uh, Northern Ireland Children's Holiday Scheme where we took children from the falls in the Shankill to Belf to, um, from Belfast to uh, Donegal. And, uh, Try to give them a, a normal holiday uh, for troubled children it was quite difficult but uh, interesting very interesting times so oh we got some uh, got some questions i think or comments in the in the box there um one person said are you able to repeat what where we should search for the uh for the project um i've popped it in the chat it's um women okay. religious blackfriars hall oxford and you'll find Brilliant. our web page Okay, so if you're looking in the chat box, it should be there somewhere. Uh, someone else has put fascinating talk. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, do we have any idea if religious sisters are involved uh, in conflict resolution in Ukraine and Russia? Yes. Um, yes, they are. Um, we know this because um, they're actually Dominican sisters and I work for a Dominican. Um, I work for the Dominicans in in um, Britain. Um, so uh dominican sisters are um working with um ukrainian refugees in poland and spain but they've also um that theme of staying with the people comes up again they're also um providing relief and um housing in their convents to people that have been um uh kind of bombed out of their houses uh during the the uh conflict um so again it's very much a focus on justice um we know that there are um conversations taking place in terms of developing peace but they are um they are being facilitated by turkey so it's unlikely that women religious are, in, are involved given that um turkey's attitude to women mm. okay uh somebody else has put powerful moving and most informative thank you which is a great, great comment. Uh, someone else said, do you think that other sisters um, uh, will come will come forward as a result of uh, the existing work being widely shared? And, and I suppose in, what, what this person is saying is with the publicity, will they more of them come forward perhaps? Yeah, yes, I mean that's 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 already happening, um, and I, I think that you know the fact that we've been working on this uh, since 2014, and particularly now that we've got a home at Oxford University, that's making a big difference. And we've we've uh, and, you know and having Marie on board because she's so well established uh, in, in in the field and you know so so well published uh, that we're already seeing a difference. Yeah, and we have them we have them all coming forward. <laughs> And the thing, the thing is, once one come forwards, um, because they they're so interlinked, they introduce you to their friends. Um, and uh, we got an email this morning, kind of saying, "Oh, um, we want to introduce you to these people." So there is a kind of snowball effect 
taking place, but it's really showing how um, how patient you have to be when you're doing oral history um, or anything that involves um, participants, particularly participants that may have experienced trauma, as some of these women will undoubtedly have done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's important that with oral testimonies, the, the participants are not re-traumatized, that we don't revisit things that are too painful. And it's only when sometimes you go back over the past that you realize that you've carried things with you for years, particularly what you've witnessed. And as I said, there wasn't always, I think it was maybe lack of knowledge. It was no insight or understanding um, into religious communities at that time that they failed to look after some sisters. Um, and um, ultimately some have carried burdens with them for years. Um, but thankfully, um, if, uh, some orders such as Dominicans and Mercies have been telling me, you know, there was psychological support offered and sisters availed of this support. But it's like everyone who has been through conflict. I mean, do we ever, ever get over some of the things that happened or that you witnessed? And sisters were in, the, were, and many sisters were actually in the midst of it. And that's the reality. But we have to remember that some of those sisters lost people in their family Absolutely. as well in, the, in this mm -hmm. conflict and suffering, mm -hmm. people arrested people, attacked, hurt, whatever, you know, other terrible things at that, that time. It was an awful time. But, uh, you know, I can remember being in Northern Ireland at that time and it wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't great in places, shall we say. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions here. Um, somebody else, but uh, thank you. So the three speakers for wonderful insight into the subject, which is fantastic. Is there any more questions at all? Be, uh, we could put them into the chat box to ask, or um, anybody else who wants to ask anything? Um, oh, yes, we've got a question here. It says, what do you think the implications of these studies are to the world today? Um, well... I'm, I'm very interested in peace and conflict in the United Nations, um, their, their resolutions uh, about women, and they've had some conversations with the United States Institute of Peace, who are trying to document, um, well, one women and then religion, but doing the two separately. Uh, and I, I, I really do think there's a, there's a whole dynamic here. Uh, that is, is completely overlooked because most of the actors are secular. And it's quite interesting if you if you talk to people um, in conflict zones, uh, one of the things they, they uh, as Sister Liz Smith emphasized, um, that the sisters are always there and you weren't even aware, aware of them. And, you know, the, the, the photo that I showed at the beginning of, of the sisters in Nicaragua, they can walk through the streets and the soldiers are, seem almost oblivious to their presence. Uh, they're just there get, uh, getting on with things. And, and it seems to have contributed to, to, to the way in which uh, their presence seems not to have been not to have been recognized. Um, so if, if you go back to, um, uh, you know, if, if you look at something like the, the NGO sector, uh, what they tend to do is go to a conflict, uh, you know, when it's active and when there's money and, and, uh, and all sorts of resources being put into it. But the minute that money has gone, they go. And one of the things that has been said to us about religious women is that they have a commitment to the place and to the people and that they they're, they're always there. So they they're there um, before the conflict begins, through the conflict and, and, and once it, once it's ended. So there's a, there's a, there's a real um, continuity there. One of the sisters that we, we, we that has just come on board, um, actually a former sister who was um, I think it was in Zimbabwe, she was in. And she was talking about a reporter that came out uh, during a conflict there. And he said to them, what, I, I don't understand. What, why are you standing here? It's so dangerous. I think at the time he was in a broom cupboard with them. where They were sheltering from the, from the gunfire. And one of the sisters said to him, well, look, when there's fighting, you can't leave. And once the fighting's over, why would you leave? Um, and it's that, it's that kind of just getting on with the job that, that I think has made them be completely overlooked. But to really understand, you know, when, when we are looking at their role, uh, and as I said, they were in these back channel talks and we, we, we've determined now and we're interviewing people from the Women's Coalition, uh, you know, that they're, they're, they're there at the bottom at community level and that they're at the top at the political level, level exerting influence. And nobody, nobody even seems to notice it. So I think you know, you need secular scholars and uh, conflict specialists, etc., to be aware of what they do and how it changes the dynamic, because it clearly 
does, and it has to be taken into consideration. Thanks, very interesting, excellent. Uh, any more, uh, oh, somebody's put, will the recording be available? We'd like to, uh, it to forward it if possible. Well, I think it's gonna be recorded on the uh, English Catholic History Association YouTube channel. Uh, and I can put the links onto the Facebook uh, group and the Twitter channel as well in due course within a few days, I would think. So yes, it, the recording will be available, certainly. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank the uh, speakers again, uh, Dr. Maria Power uh, and Bree Rafferty and uh, Diane Kirby as well for their wonderful presentations this evening. And uh, it's certainly a very, very interesting topic and uh, one that we can all learn from. Uh, conflict continues, sadly, all over the world. There never seems to be a time when there isn't conflict. But it's good that these sisters and other women are involved in these projects because... Um, they're very much needed and it's uh it's so sad to see so much suffering and pain especially what's going on in ukraine at the minute really uh, and, and in many other places of conflict so thank you very much to our wonderful speakers this evening and uh and thank you to everybody who's come uh this evening and attended the talk as well so thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.